I think that's the second time we read through it and we got to discuss it. We didn't really get down through everything, but there's one, one passage I'd like to discuss before we move completely out of 8, and that's the last verse in what it says there. Chapter 8, verse 17 of Ecclesiastes. Yes, it's Ecclesiastes. I didn't tell you that, did I? Uh, I saw every work of God. I concluded that man cannot discover the work which has been done under the sun. Even though man may seek laboriously, he will not discover. And though the wise man should say, I know, he cannot discover. Did we discuss this at all last week? Did we? Did we, we didn't really. Okay. I don't know what your take would be on this, but are we still learning things about the universe? Yes. Oh, yes, we are. We're even version, finding out that some of the things we thought we knew, we don't. My version says comprehend instead of understand. Okay. And, and I, I like that because we don't. We right. can't comprehend everything. I like the word comprehend. It has the idea of encircling. Mm -hmm. and, and we haven't encircled much. We really haven't. We've used science to some degree very beneficially. I was just watching a news report today about this new stealth fighter that they launched off a carrier deck. It's unmanned. We've gotten to the point where we're sending fighters off carrier decks that don't have any people in them. The guy's got a little box in his hand and he's doing this. Uh, oh yeah. For that signal to go through the air that you can't see, feel, or hear and it's, it's being received by that mechanism somehow and it's doing all kinds of crazy stuff. The whole thing, I mean when you look up in the air and you see one of these tankers going by full of gas, you know that thing weighs about a million tons and, and somehow the lift on those wings allows it to fly. It's, it's unreal. There have been several hands. I think PJ was first and then Art. And there might be some more. Uh, that's okay. Uh, I, I found out what I was asking. You found out already? Are y'all talking in class back there? You know that's not allowed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Art. Well, in, I think it's in Genesis where it says that uh, God came down to confound man because if man got together, there would be nothing beyond, nothing past what he could do because of his imagination. Yes. And we are seeing today some of those things. There are individuals that have in their hands technology and capability that people a hundred years ago would have thought uh, they're from outer space or something like that. And so um, we just we just do not realize how far something like what is going on now. When you when you talk to tech people or scientists and they start to explain how far we've come in 50 years, it is mind-boggling. Well, who doesn't have a cell phone today? I mean, if somebody were to say to you, oh, I don't have a cell phone, you go, you don't have a cell phone? <laughs> Everybody's got a cell phone, and who can you call with a cell phone? Anybody else with a cell phone? Anywhere on the planet, up in the air, anywhere you within reach of a cell tower, you, you can call somebody on a cell phone. <coughs> Billy? Part of this uh, high school <coughs> talk about here is even in the fact of personal, uh, personal identification, facial recognition, security, uh, they've already got that before Congress. See, the cell phone's working right there. <laughs> they've already got that before Congress and Supreme Court that it's unconstitutional for your for a personal uh, security, that they don't want people recognizing face recognition and things like that. But it, to one point, I can see the benefit of it for criminals are looking for. But if you look at this show they on TV called Numbers, actually, I know that's just a fictitious show and everything that they got going on there, but a lot of that they're saying in there, facial recognition, people, and backgrounds has already been proven. And that's what they're arguing in Congress and the Senate and going to the Supreme Court with it. For personal privacy or security, the government should not be able to do this, but they are. What was the book 1984 all about? And all the kids were going, 1984, <coughs> Big Brother. Big Brother. 1984. When was that book written? 83. <laughs> <laughs> How long ago was 1984? And they were they were projecting that then. It's fascinating. Yeah, you know, there's there's been a computer around for facial recognition for thousands of years called the human mind. And when you think about what the human mind can do, it is truly 
Can you say mind-boggling? <laughs> you think about what, what the mind can what we can do with our subconscious. The fact that my mind, or some aspect of my neurological system, and yours too, is controlling what every organ in my body is doing. Something is telling everything to do what it does. And something is telling every cell in my body, or my body to somehow remanufacture all the cells that are dying. I don't know, where did that information come from? It, it really is mind-boggling. What's the first thing that God created? Do you remember? <coughs> And God said, let there be light. Have we scientifically defined light? Just barely. We, what's that? Absent of darkness. Yeah, absent of darkness, that's, that's how we define it. But we really don't even know what light is. Isn't that something? What is life? We haven't even defined what life is. Or, or exactly when it, well, we know when it starts, but... All right, I saw a hand. Was it Judy? Who was it? Oh, Mark. 1984 was published in 1949. 1949. The book 1984 was written. How many of you know what 1984 is about? It was this futuristic society, and Big Brother was watching everything. And By the way, uh, Billy mentioned the show. Numbers. numbers. It's not numbers. It's a... Uh, Person of interest. Person of interest, yes. How many of you have seen that program, Person of Interest? Do you know who plays the, the strong man on that show? Jim Caviezel. You know who Jim Caviezel was? Jesus Christ. He played Jesus in, in the movie The Passion. So that just gives you some perspective there. Uh, I don't know what kind of perspective. But <laughs> some kind of perspective. In other words, Solomon's saying, and it's, it's not like this wasn't 3,000 years ago. This was 3,000 years ago. It's been 3,000 years since Solomon said this, and it is no less true today than it was 3,000 years ago. Because we might read this and think, well, yeah, 3,000 years ago. There's a lot of things people didn't know. Well, a lot of things we don't know today. And what really blows me away is, as humanity, we're making all the same stupid mistakes over and over and over and over. Nobody is saying, hey, we did this 1,000 years ago. It caused a huge war. We shouldn't do that again. Oh, no. Let's do it again. It's, and it all comes back to sin. Marty, that, that boils down to there's nothing new under the sun. But technology, in 1975 through 79, I was active duty Air Force. We were testing the idea of flying unmanned vehicles then at Wendover Range in NASA in 1975. And going through that program there in four years, and we launched 100 of those things and lost two of them from the low altitude. Not on our part, but yet... In 1978, I saw the first F-4 Phantom take off from Nellis Air Force Base with nobody in the cockpit. Hmm. It took off, flew around, and landed by itself with a guy over here with a joystick and a little computer. Yeah, how today, about that? Today, these drones and predators and things you see and hear about, and, and now they're trying to want to use them in the United States to watch stuff, or Big Brother and stuff like that, are being flown right here in the United States in Afghanistan. Eyes on scene and being controlled here. Yeah. You know. Well, that's who doesn't how, have a GPS? Just in 20, 30 years, you know. Uh, you get a GPS in your car, and there's a little voice on there saying, turn here. You missed the turn. You're stupid. Do a U-turn. Go back. <laughs> ding, ding, ding. It's, it's, it, it's bouncing off a, a satellite up there fast enough to know exactly where you are at that exact moment. You don't have to wait 15 seconds for it to catch up. It's, it's there. It's on you. Wow. You know, Marty, when Tom Tom tells you to do something, sometimes it's not in your best interest to do that. That's, that's probably true. <laughs> now, think about this, too. We're, we're talking about the wonders of the created universe and everything that is in it. God spoke it all into existence. He brought it all into existence. And there are, there are those who say, well, I don't believe in God because I cannot find God. I cannot see God. I can't hear him or smell him or touch him. But think about this. God spoke the universe into existence. So we shouldn't expect God to be in the universe. If you found a car somewhere, and you would, we don't even think far enough away from this to even consider that somebody would say, well, this car just made itself. Well, why do you think it made itself? Well, because I'm looking at this car and I can't find the one who made it here. So if the one who made this car is not here, there must not be a creator of this car. 
And I know you're listening to me thinking, Marty, that's stupid, but that's, that's what people are essentially saying when they're denying the existence of God because they can't find him in the universe. Do you ever find the builder of a house in the house? There are occasions, but most of the time, the guy that built the house is long gone with your money, too. <laughs> I'm, I'm just trying to point out a few things from this that no matter how much we think we know, we can't learn it all, and this is God's guarantee <coughs> you won't learn it all. There are things we can't understand and should understand. Those things are revealed to us, but like Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, the secret things belong to the Lord our God. Mike. True. You never get any better. That's why we need to study history. That's why God gave us a book of history. Yes. If you don't learn from your mistakes, you're destined to repeat them. All right. Anybody got anything else on anything we've covered in chapter 8 or in Ecclesiastes so far? If not, we'll read chapter 9 together. And I need three readers. I need somebody for verses 1 through 6. All right, PJ, somebody for 7 through 12. Come on, come on. Jenny, somebody for 13 to 18. Mark, let's go. Let's read chapter 9 of Ecclesiastes. For I have taken all this to my heart and explained it that righteous men, wise men, and their deeds are in the hand of God. Man does not know whether it will be love or hatred. Anything awaits him. It is the same for all. There is one faith for the righteous and for the wicked, for the good, unclean, for the man who offers a sacrifice and for the one who does not sacrifice. As a good man is, so is the sinner. As the swearer is, so is the one who is afraid to swear. This is an evil in all that is done under the sun, that there is one faith for all men. Furthermore, the hearts of the sons of men are full of evil and insanity is in their hearts throughout their lives. Afterwards, they go to the dead. For whoever is joined with all living, there is hope. Surely a live dog is better than a dead lion. For the living know they will die, but the dead do not know anything, nor have they any longer a reward, for their memory is forgotten. Indeed, their love, their hate, and their zeal have already perished, and they will no longer have a share in all that is done under the sun. Go then, eat your bread in happiness, and drink your wine with a cheerful heart. For God has already approved your works. Let your clothes be white all the time, and let not and let not oil be lacking on your head. Enjoy life with the woman whom you love all the days of your fleeting life, which he has given to you under the sun. For this is your reward in life, and in your toil in which you have labored under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might, for there is no activity or planning or knowledge or wisdom in shale where you are going. I again saw under the sun that the race is not to be swift, and the battle is not to the warriors, and neither is the bread to the wise, nor the wealth to the discerning, nor favor to men of ability, for time and chance overtake them all. Moreover, man does not know his time, like a fish caught in a treacherous net, and the birds trapped in a snare, so the sons of men are ensnared at the evil time when the sun will fall, suddenly fall upon them. Also this I came to see is wisdom under the sun, and it impressed me. There was a small city with few men in it, and a great king came to it and surrounded it, and constructed large siege works against it. But there was found in it a poor wise man, and he delivered the city by his wisdom, yet no one remembered that poor man. So I said, Wisdom is better than strength. But the wisdom of the poor man is despised, and his words are not needed. The words of the wise heard in quietness are better than the shouting of a ruler among thousands. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much good. Thank you, readers. Look at that first verse of chapter 9. Is there anything in there that excites you? 
But he thought long and hard about the God who controls the actions of the wise, the righteous, and their lives, and their love, and their hate. God controls everything about us. We might think we're in control, but we're not. Okay. Yeah. PJ. I was just, the part where it says that uh, righteous men, wise men, and their deeds are in the hand of God. Okay. That's very comforting to me. Yeah. I, both of you are, are saying to me essentially the same thing, which is what the passage is saying. Is anything else about this? All right. Solomon may have been the wisest man of his time. That's probably something that's debatable for some people. But he asked when he was a young man for wisdom from God, and God gave it to him. The thing that he did not know was the gospel of Christ. True. Some, some of his comments, um, I guess the best way to say it would be limited to an extent because he did not have uh, the knowledge of the gospel of Christ. That's something we ought to keep in mind, not just about Solomon, but about everybody up through the time until Jesus was resurrected from the dead. They didn't have the benefit of looking back in time to see that God raised his son from the dead. Their faith, to me, was a much stronger faith. Not that there wasn't sufficient to base it on, but what we have today huh, far surpasses, I think, what they had. Anything else about verse 1? Does it not excite you to think that you have no clue what's going to happen tomorrow, but something's going to happen? It might be love. What else might it be? It might be hate. It could be anything in between. Isn't that exciting? Who's going to be with you when it happens? God is. Who's going to help you through it when it happens? God is. It doesn't matter. It might just be a normal day. Whatever that is. You might just get up, have a little breakfast, have a little coffee, go to work, things be quiet till noon, you have some lunch, you go to work in the afternoon, you come home, you watch a little TV, you go to bed. Maybe that's going to be your day. But we don't know, do we? We don't know if we're going to make it home tonight. There's an, in, there's an insight here. If God's going to be with you with tomorrow, which we don't even know about, who should we be giving thanks to and glorifying? God. Right. That's the essence of the whole thing here. Wake up, people. Yeah. He just said in the end of chapter 8, we can't figure anything out. It's, it's far, we can't comprehend it. We can't understand it. But here's one thing that's true. God is the one who's in control. And you and I don't know if it's going to be love or hate tomorrow, but God's in control. And even though we can't figure it out, that's okay. That's the way it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. The just shall live by faith. faith. We read that once or twice in the scriptures. It's the same for all. No, what's he talking about that's the same for all? Well, they keep reading. There's one fate for the righteous and one for the wicked. For the good, the clean, the unclean, the man who offers a sacrifice, one who does not sacrifice. What's he talking about? What's the one fate? Death. Death. We're all going to die. The richest man in the world is going to die. Poorest man in the world is going to die. Smartest man is going to die. Doesn't matter. We're going to die. And they're all going to die. Come to judgment. Yes. It's appointed unto man once to die. And after that, the judgment. That's what the Hebrew writer says. I, I do not mock any of those who are all about good health and eating healthy. I believe in eating healthy. I know. You're looking at me thinking, Marty, you're a liar. <laughs> I didn't say I did it. I said I believe in it. There's, there are things we believe in that we don't do perfectly. However, if you are the most knowledgeable and the most disciplined health nut in the world, what's going to happen to you someday? You're going to die. You know where I'm going with this because that's where Solomon's going with this. Does this have anything to do with what we read last week? Do not be overly righteous and do not be overly wicked. What should govern our own personal rules for eating. Well, don't be a glutton. Yeah, really. <laughs> How about, don't we hear it all the time, moderation? Mm -hmm. God has designed a wonderful body for us. You can put a lot of things in here and it'll filter out a lot of the bad. Just don't overdo it. Easy, easy. But don't go drive yourself crazy over trying to be healthy either. Because we're all going to die. 
I think verse 4 is a very interesting point of view. Whoever is joined with all the living, there's hope. Surely a live dog better than a dead lion. You get that imagery? Unless you're hungry. The living know they'll die, but the dead don't know anything, nor have they any longer a reward, for their memory is forgotten. I do not know how specifically Solomon is describing the state of the dead. Marty, is that the memory of this life or the memory? I know they know yes. where they're at because rich men and Lazarus knew where they were at. Yes. So are we talking about the memory of this former life we had before we die? In, in what little bit we have of information in Scripture about those who've already passed on, mm -hmm. it sort of looks both ways. Lazarus was in the bosom of Abraham, and he was comforted. How much, Was he awake? Was he asleep? Was he conscious? Because when, when you're asleep and you're having good sleep and you wake up, you don't know what just happened, but you know, man, it was good. I, I slept good last night. What's that mean? Do you remember sleeping good? I'm not sure. But somehow, it was, it was a good thing. Absolutely. Who did the disciples, the apostles, Peter, James, and John, when they were with you, who did they see on the Mount of Transfiguration? Moses and Elijah. Moses and Elijah. Were they in some kind of a sleeping stupor? I don't think so. They were with Jesus. They were talking with the Lord. So there's, there's something about a consciousness after death. But, but Solomon's got to be making some point here about that. Mark? Right. And where's he talking about this happening? Here. Under the sun. He, he brings it back to this context of under the sun. They don't have anything here anymore. You're gone. When we, and I'm not asking whether or not we should, because I definitely believe that we should, but when we honor the dead, is there any real benefit to them? Why do we honor the dead? It's for our benefit. Their family. It's for us. So that we will impart a value <coughs> But what these people lived and died for was worthy, and we're, we're trying to show that. We're not doing it for them. I mean, there might be some sense of it in our own minds, but the reality is they're gone. They're gone. If, if I just go away to the next state and you have a party for me and celebrate my life while I'm gone, I don't know anything about it. Hey, thanks. But yeah, Marty, that's for why, you. That's why people put headstones up, because in 1887, when Joseph Bay, whoever, was here and they left a loving father, grandfather, faithful, whatever, nobody knows that. Nobody remembers that. I mean, who's around in 1887 to know that this person was a loving whoever? Right. You know, that, that comforts not only the, the family at the time, but as I've been to funer uh, cemeteries and stuff and funerals and things like that and walk around and see 100-year-old graves, it make you wonder about that person and what little bit is said about them. You know, uh, and how much, I mean, they had a whole life more than one or two sentences. Loving father, loving son, blessed child, and that's all we know. Right. And then they're forgotten. There's, there's some psychology to this, and I don't, I don't think Solomon's trying to get into this, but I think it's a good point to bring it up. Because we are created in the image of God. I don't think that's just talking about physical. I, I think it's talking about the whole aspect of our, of our being. There is a lot of psychology to be considered when someone dies and you know intellectually they're not there anymore, their spirit is gone. But have you ever done it or do you know somebody else who's done it? You sit by the, the, the bedside of someone who is dead, their body's there, and you hold their hand. Or have you ever done it yourself? You go past the casket, someone you love, what do you do? You touch them. You, you touch them. You gotta reach out, you gotta stroke their head one more time. Yeah. Well, there was also a practical reason for that, too, because a lot of people they thought were dead weren't. So. <laughs> what they call it? Awake. Awake. Why'd they call it awake? Because you didn't go to sleep. <laughs> and then, 
there's the old joke about the old the, the guys that set up with the dead guy. And, you know, one of them said, well, if you all are going to stay up, I'm, I'm going to bed. And the second guy said, well, if you've got to stay up, I'm, I'm going on to bed. And the, and the third guy was left there by himself. And, and the old body, the muscles tightened up and the nerves twitched and the thing sat up in the casket. And the last guy said, well, if you're going to stay up, I'm going to bed. <laughs> <laughs> but that was the idea. I mean, you sat up and dead. <laughs> but we are. We're compelled to show honor. What is it? about our makeup that compels us to show honor for those who have died unless it's some aspect of godliness that once again we don't completely understand. I, I don't know but but it's not about showing somebody else even if I'm by myself even if you're by yourself you will still do and say things that show honor even if you know nobody else has seen it because you, you just feel compelled to do that. And Marty, you've never seen on a gravestone, here lies the honoriest person you've ever known. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, ne it's always something good about people. Yeah. yeah. What was that one? Uh, here lies Ned poisoned by lead when he took three shots to the back of the head or something. <laughs> <laughs> the good old boy. Yeah. <laughs> Mall of... Paul, Paul loved women. Paul caught Paul with two in swimming. Here lies Paul. You know, <laughs> there's all kinds of hits to them. Yeah? Yeah? Well, it's, there's a lot of sense of humor in the world, even among those who have, have passed on. At any rate, I want you to look down at verse 6. Where he says, indeed, their love, their hate, their zeal have already perished, and they will no longer have a share in all that is done where? Under the sun. Under the sun. That's what he's talking about. When you're dead, you're gone from this place. You're not here anymore, and you don't have any more share in what's going on here. So that's why he throws verse 7 at us again, just like he's done so many times before. Eat your bread in happiness and drink your wine with a cheerful heart. God's already approved your works. Let your clothes be white all the time, and let not oil be lacking on your head. Enjoy life with the woman you love all the days of your fleeting life, Bobby Chilton, which he has given to you under the sun. For this is your reward in life, and your toil in which you have labored under the sun. Isn't that encouraging? I, I love that. That's great. When I go home tonight, get a little dish of ice cream. <laughs> I mean, seriously, you think I'm kidding. I'm saying, yeah, this is what it's all about. I don't have to feel guilty. God gave me this ice cream. I don't have to eat a half a gallon of it. But he gave us ice cream. He gave us wonderful things to drink. He gave us beverages that are pleasant to drink. That's what makes fasting worthwhile. Is when you give up something that you would normally very much enjoy. When you give that up, it keeps reminding you of the reason for your fast. It's, it's wonderful the way that works. Verse 10. Since we're all going to die and there's not going to be anything more of us when we're done, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. There's no activity or planning or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol, the grave, where you are going. By the way, Sheol and hell are not the same place. Now, the scriptures speak of Hades and Sheol, which both of those refer to the place of the dead. When Lazarus and the rich man died, Luke chapter 16, both of them went to Hades. Both of them went to Sheol. Both of them went to the grave. But the place called Hades is separated by a great gulf. It's two parts. One is paradise, place of comfort. The other is torment. And there's a great gulf in between. That's right. We don't go to hell or heaven until we face the judgment. Yes. It, it's like a holding tank. And, and you've already been assigned a place one way or the other. Excuse me. Verse 11. Again I saw under the sun, under the sun, that the race is not to the swift and the battle is not to the warriors. Neither is bread to the wise nor wealth to the discerning nor favor to men of ability for Time and chance overtake them all. What does that mean? Time and chance overtake them all. Depends on where you're at and what's going on at the time of your life. Okay, I say refer back to chapter 9, verse 1. What does 9-1 say? You don't know what's coming down the road tomorrow. 
We make our plans. Now this is from Proverbs chapter 16, verse 9. The mind of man plans his way, but what else is part of that verse? The Lord directs his steps. Do you have a plan for tomorrow? I do. I got a plan for tomorrow. I plan to get up early, drive over to the preacher's breakfast over on 240 in May. Probably be finished up there by around 830. Head back. I might stop at Walmart. Part of my plan. And come back, be by the office here, probably about 915, 930. Eat lunch around 1215, 1230. Probably be off and on my way home by 515 that after. That's my plan. Am I going to get to do that? Lord willing. Exactly. James was talking about that because he wants us to have a sense of connection with God and humility before God. That if God's got a plan other than mine, that's okay. Lord willing, I'll get to wake up in the morning. I might not get to wake up in the morning. I might not make it home tonight. Is that okay? If God is with me, that's okay. Is he with me? Is he with you? Does that make all the difference, PJ? It, it, you know, the, the, the little child of me wants to whine, you know, it's not fair. You know, if I do everything I'm supposed to, do everything right, and I'm a good girl, blah, 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 you know, why don't things turn out well for me? And that's, and that's what this whole verse is about. You know, just because you do everything the way you're supposed to, doesn't mean that everything's going to turn out well because it's time and chance. But the little girl who still wants to whine, it's not fair. Sure. I did everything I was supposed to. You don't have to be a little girl to want that. I want that too. <laughs> and hopefully, the fact that we see such unfairness and such injustice in this world, hopefully that will not create in us a cynicism. But rather, a greater dependency on God to bring about a, a final judgment and to right everything that's wrong. That's what we hope will happen. Because the world's a mess, and there's a lot of stuff going on that's not fair. As a matter of fact, if we back up just a little bit, uh, chapter 8, verse 12, although a sinner does evil a hundred times and may lengthen his life, still I know it will be well for those who fear God, who fear him openly. But it will not be well for the evil man, and he will not lengthen his days like a shadow because he does not fear God. In other words, there is some degree of fairness going on even now. Mike? I think Mark Twain said something that kind of sums up these verses. All right. He said, uh, live your life so that when you die, even the undertaker will be sad. Yeah, really. That's a good way to put it. Live your life so that when you die, even the undertaker will be sad. Yeah, so the preacher won't have to lie. <laughs> Mike said it was... Uh, Mark Twain said that. I was thinking Samuel Clemens. At any rate, <laughs> one of those guys. All right, they're brothers. Chapter, yeah, they're brothers. Uh, chapter 9, verse 12. Moreover, man does not know his time like fish caught in a treacherous net, birds trapped in a snare. So the sons of men are ensnared in an evil time when it suddenly falls on them. All this I came to see as wisdom under the sun. And it impressed me. It impressed me tragically tonight to read about a young person. Nita, I don't know how, how young that young lady was, but I assume she was young. 18. And I'm sure when they got in that car and they left, they had no idea 
that she wouldn't be coming back. And are there any of us as parents that have not thought that about our kids? You stand at the door, your kids are going off, they're just going to go down to McDonald's with a couple of friends and get a burger and come back later. And you stand there and you watch and you wave and you think, Lord, bring them back. Because that might be the last time I see them alive. And it's an absolute truth for a lot of parents. Same thing with us and our folks. We see our folks one day, everything seems to be well, next thing you know, we're getting a phone call. Hey, you need to come home. And it's, it's life. That's the way it works. If we didn't have God, how would we make it through those times? How many of us have said that? How do people make it who don't have God? It's hard enough when you do have the Lord. But anyway, verse 13, also this I came to see as wisdom under the sun that impressed me. There was a small city with a few men in it. A great king came to it, surrounded it, constructed large siege works against it. But there was found in it a poor wise man, and he delivered the city by his wisdom. Wouldn't you like to know how? What did he do? Did he invent a miniature atom bomb and throw it over the wall? What did he do? But it doesn't say. It just says by his wisdom he delivered the city. Yet what happened? He was forgotten. No one remembered the poor man. So I said, wisdom is better than strength. But the wisdom of the poor man is despised, and his words are not heeded. The words of the wise heard in quietness are better than the shouting of a ruler among fools. Wisdom is better than the weapons of war. Any amens there? Wouldn't it be great if, uh, what's his name in North Korea? Yeah, King Jong-un. Walked up to the fence and waved and said, hey, hey, listen, I'm sorry about all that mess a while ago. Uh, how about we tear this fence down and we, we build a bigger factory than the one we're having to struggle over right now. And, and, and let's try uh, being Koreans together. Well, yeah, probably so. <laughs> but, but wouldn't that be great if Al-Qaeda gave a call to Washington and said, hey, listen, I'm sorry about all that trouble you're going through with the IRS and, and the uh, Associated <laughs> Press and all that mess. But, but we want you to know, maybe ease some of your heartache. We're, we don't hate you guys anymore. Uh, we would like to get together with you and learn some, some uh, ways to build a school and a hospital because our people over in Afghanistan need that stuff. And can you help us out? Uh, we got this fight going on between the Shiites and the Sunnis and we're tired of killing each other. What's this say? Wisdom is better than the weapons of war. Not much wisdom in the earth seems like sometimes, is there? We tend to depend more on the weapons of war much more than we should. Marty, I had an elderly guy tell me once was discussing war and serving in the military and being around war that if it hadn't been for war and that person he had to shoot to protect his life and come home to his family, he often wondered if they'd have met in a different situation what they would have been. If they sure. could have been friends instead of allies against each other. And yet, you know, as you go and People have to make that decision to shoot or not shoot or kill somebody or not kill somebody. That should be going through your mind, but yet you need to go home to your family every night. And just as much as he wants to go home to his family. So I see the balance there and the unbalance of war. But wouldn't it have been nice to be able to just get together and, you know, here's an 18-year-old kid in a foxhole and here you're an 18-year-old kid in a, in a foxhole and just go over and talk about 18-year-old stuff, you know, yeah. instead of worried about trying to kill somebody. There are, uh, there are historical accounts about the, the Allies and the Germans in the First World War during the Christmas holidays. They called a truce. They even got together, uh, shared some of the food, had a soccer match, those kinds of things. And then, of course, when that was, the holidays were over, they, they went back to war. Uh, if you look at the last part of verse 18, before that last bell rings, wisdom is better than the weapons of war, but how does it end? One sinner destroys much good. Who got World War II off the ground? Adolf Hitler, one guy. Of course, it was one man who rallied a whole nation around him. But who was in charge in Japan? Emperor Hirohito. One man can destroy much good. In some cases, one woman can destroy much good. It just depends on, on the mindset.
Well, that's the end of chapter 9. There's not much point in starting in chapter 10. Anybody got anything else? Any <coughs> observations or questions? Or anything? <coughs> mm -hmm. For example, I'm in my own house. I know where everything is, but it's dark. And my intellectual <coughs> mind is telling me, Marty, there's nothing down the hall. You know there's nothing down the hall. Besides, you've got a 45 in your hand. <laughs> <laughs> but my imagination is saying, you remember that preview? It was just a preview for one of these uh, paranormal movies. <laughs> some demon-possessed person. One of the scariest things that's in my mind is that little girl on Grudge that crawls out of the TV set. You can't be secure anywhere if they can get you right out of your TV set. I'm telling you, I know that can't happen. The intellectual part of me says it can't. There's no possible way, but my imagination can sometimes trump my intellect. It's interesting to me, none of this ever happens when I'm out in the woods. <laughs> I'm serious. I walk in the woods at night, going out to my hunting spot, coming back out of my hunts. I don't worry about that, but in a house for some reason, I guess because of all the scary movies I've seen, except that one, uh, what was that one, the witch, the Blair Witch Project? You never even saw the witch. How did they scare you with that movie? It was, it was how they manipulated your mind. So. Be careful about what you put in your imagination. And try to spend your time like Paul said in Philippians. If there's anything that's lovely, anything of good report, anything of kindness, of godliness, think on those kinds of things, and you'll be better prepared for what Solomon's talking about here. All right, I've kept you long enough. Thank you. Marty, I had one more one more thought for you since you like like, like that. All right. In 1963, my dad just was uh, dealing in TV repair, black and white, before they got the all color and transistors and all that stuff. And his theory was, if they can send that signal into your house for you to watch it, they can watch you through that signal. That is true today. Really? Huh. What? <laughs> Who would want to watch me sitting in front of the TV? <laughs> Eat that ice cream. The failure of this. So be careful what you do in your house. What you want to do. Thank <laughs> you.